Uh, let me start by saying that I missed George Drake by all of three months when I first came up to Grinnell, and I've sure tried to make up for that for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, George is extraordinary, as you all know, and will be constantly reminded uh, by me, among others. <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to tell you about a road trip which he and Susan made at the very end of last year, of 2018. It was a 1,900-mile road trip in their car, and it demonstrated to me, once again, George's sense of ecumenism, of being ecumenical, because they went to Michigan, and he was so ecumenical as to include the Upper Peninsula and Detroit. It was partly because their daughter Cindy lives in the UP and their son Chris in Detroit, but it sort of is indicative of a frame of mind. And speaking of ecumenism, about a year ago, George and I had an exchange of emails because I had a, a sort of buzzing thought in my mind. I remembered dimly that when we came at my time in 1956 to college, that there was not only still required chapel, but that there was a formal affiliation with the United Church of Christ, the Congregational Church. And I remembered, and, and this as a sort of, you know, semi-historian or at least history student struck me as almost amusing. I remembered dimly also that we were the diocesan church of the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church of Iowa. And George wrote back to me this wonderful email, and he said, John, you're right. And of course, it, it tickled my funny bone to think that you have the dissenters, the Congregationalists and the Anglicans, the Church of England's, whom the dissenters fled on the Mayflower to get over here, <laughs> together honoring Grinnell College as their formal affiliation. And George said, yes, he said, there was indeed an Episcopal bishop on the board of Grinnell College. And his dad was, for many years in his career, the United Church of Christ representative outreach to college ministries and the denominational man for the, for the United Church of Christ working with universities. Fast forward, says George. He said, when I was president, he said, things had changed. We had fallen away, if you will, and we're not very observant any longer in, uh, in terms of the relation with the UCC. And he said, more than that, he said, there was a sort of crankiness on the part of some members of their Council of Higher Education, which was made up of the presidents and the chaplains of the colleges, like Carlton, Beloit, Grinnell, on and on. And he said it came to a head when he was president and he went to a meeting of the Council of Higher Education of the church. And they were all very upset because they were still giving money to Grinnell and to Carlton, along with hundreds of other smaller, more active church-affiliated schools. And so George, with the president of Carlton College, uh, when, when it came to a head in the form of the rest of these folks saying, we're going to ask you to swear to a statement. Your board of trustees and your faculty all have to say that we are you know, basically believers in the United Church of Christ. And George thought, I'm not sure that will fly. <laughs> <laughs> and so he and Bob Clark, I think it was, who was the president of Carlton, uh, said, well, let's find, a, let's find a diplomatic way out here, and did. And what they said was, let's call ourselves historically related, historically affiliated, and we won't take any more money. It can go, the pot, the small pot can go to the other schools. Satisfied. Well, Georgia went on to have this wonderful uh, sense of the yin and the yang of religious confrontations and so on in his career. And he became, as you probably know, a, a very, very uh, focused and loving scholar of uh, Stuart England and the Cromwell Revolution and back to the Stuarts. And, and there's a wonderful story, too, I mean, in terms of ecumenism, but they weren't very ecumenical together uh, with the Catholics and then the, the very, very high church Anglicans. And then then you have Cromwell, who of course had a theocracy of which the Ayatollah Khomeini would be proud, and then back to the Stuarts again. Uh, but that brings me to George's teaching, because that is the thing that stands out most about him. And uh, I got a taste of that teaching because for the only time the Board of Trustees ever met overseas, we met while George was happening to teach a segment in the Grinnell in London program, and so I caught a 50-minute lecture on the Stuarts, thanks to him, and in a proper setting in London. 
But uh, George is most of all a, a great teacher. And if you have not read, do read or go back to reread the wonderful piece in Grinnell Magazine, which ran a couple of years back <clears throat> about him, looking at him through the eyes of many of his former students as a teacher and a mentor. And that is his great accomplishment. But more than that is his devotion to the college. And you'll find that writ large in the book about Joe Rosenfield, uh, his own sense of scholarship, his own background in what I just described comes to play and his powerful and wonderful description of Grinnell as one of those pearls scattered across the country, which were originally congregational colleges like Harvard and Grinnell and, and uh, uh, Oberlin and Pomona, uh, but he talks about the social gospel movement with great authority and, and great passion, and that was also Grinnell for all of us. But let me just conclude by saying that George Drake is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much, John. I, I've got this mic here and this one, so I, I hope. That, can you hear me okay in the, in, the, in the back? Okay, good. That was a, my most gracious introduction. And John and I go back a long ways and uh, sort of started out as fellow trustees and then had the relationship when, as the trustees were very quick to inform me when I became president, I was demoted. <laughs> They said, George, remember, you work for us now. <laughs> and uh, it was a very, very good advice as I launched into my career as, uh, with the presidency. Well, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to address this year's reunion. And I'm given that opportunity by the class of 1969, those kids <laughs> who I cannot believe are celebrating their 50th reunion at, uh, at Grinnell. Well, I do appreciate the invitation, and I'm going to try uh, to include you folks, in a, you know, generically at least, in at, at least uh, some, if not many, of my remarks, because I am going to focus on the student revolution uh, from many perspectives, but an interesting perspective uh, is from the trustee minutes. I, uh, as you know, I've got this biography of Joe, and by the way, I, I will continue to sign copies after this, this lecture, so uh, if, if you're interested, I would do that. Uh, but I went through every single trustee minute from 1941 until 2000. That was the period why, while well, Joe was a trustee at the college. 59 years. He became a trustee eight days before Pearl Harbor. Uh, and he said many times afterwards, if he'd known the financial condition of the college, he might have decided not to become <laughs> a trustee. He soon sat down and calculated the endowment and he subtracted the dormitories from the endowment because until almost 1970, the dormitories were included in the uh, calculation of the endowment of Grinnell. They do produce income, but they do not produce profit. Uh, and particularly on the North Campus side, uh, they did not produce profit. <laughs> you spent a lot more money trying to keep those dorms habitable uh, than uh, North Campus. For those who are more recent graduates, the North Campus was the men, where the men were. Um, and he calculated that the endowment was worth about $78,000. And from his point of view, as a person with real financial acumen, there's no way this college could survive with such a small, slender endowment. And in fact, most of that endowment was tied up in farms. Some years the farms were profitable, some years they were not. So he decided we needed to get into equities and a few things like that. We'll be saying something about that as we go along. But it was fascinating to look at those board minutes. Uh, as John could easily tell you, particularly as you go through history, they become more and more, uh, what shall I say, pale 
uh, and, not, and non interesting. I can remember when I was president, the lawyers would go over the minutes taken by the secretary to excise as much material as possible that might identify anything that anyone said or anything much more than the decisions that were made because of financial liability. But earlier board minute minutes are quite revealing. Uh, Sam Stevens was my president, at least for the first two years, and he would lecture the board it would almost give a sermon to the board at every meeting, and those sermons were included in the minutes. Very, very interesting to see that. Well, uh, one of the real revelations of these minutes is that the students hardly appear in the board minutes. The names are there if the list of graduates happens to be included, and sometimes they were, sometimes not. Uh, and that was about it. Numbers are there. We have su a student body of such and such a size. Our, our entering class is such and such a size. That was, that, that was, those were the students in the board minutes. Then you come to about 1964. <laughs> and gradually and then suddenly, the students are everywhere in those minutes. In other words, the student revolution is happening, and the trustees discover the students. <laughs> they not only discover them, they have to cope with the students. They have to cope with you 69 folks. Uh, you plague the board to no end. And, and, and as you move along, the student issues become half the board meeting discussion two-thirds of the board meeting discussion. The faculty begins to complain that they're being ignored by the Board of Trustees <laughs> as they focus exclusively on the students. Then as you get a little further along, I, I, I'm not quite aware of, of whether students invaded board meetings in the late 60s. Certainly when you get to the 70s, they do. I'll never forget, uh, I, I became a board member in 1970. Uh, and we would meet with the African-American, or as we call them then, the black students. I'm uh, telling John that story last night. Well, we, we adjourned to Grinnell House to the, to, for that meeting with the, with the black students. They had very carefully arranged themselves so that the trustees, there would be a ch chair available, a black student, a chair available, a black student. <laughs> And I sat next to a football player who was in a tank top who kept flexing his muscles. <laughs> so this is where the trustees are going. And, I, and as I say, I want to talk a bit about the student revolution from a variety of perspectives, but also the trustee perspective. And we'll have time for uh, questions, discussion, and so on. There are going to be a couple of mics, in, one in each, each row. I'm particularly interested in, in you 69 folks, uh, your response to, to your own time here. And I know you've had some opportunity to do that already. Uh, and to see what you make of your revolution after I've tried to describe your revolution. But I'm going to start back. I'm an historian, as John uh, so well indicated. And I want to start a little bit with the tr sort of traditions of Grinnell College that lead up to the student revolutionary period. We began as a, an extremely orthodox Christian college. The uh, founders of the college were recent graduates of Andover Seminary in Massachusetts. Now that's important that it was Andover because Andover Seminary was a breakaway from Harvard Seminary, which in the late 18th century had essentially become Unitarian, not very Orthodox Christian. So the Orthodox Christian folks left Harvard and founded Andover. So these, and that was in, in 1807 that that was done. And so these graduates of the late 1830s are you know, essentially 30 years after the foundation of this very orthodox seminary. And if you were to have been on the campus at that time, it was, the curriculum was designed to produce good intellectual congregational pastors for the frontier. 
the frontier was at that time was the Trans Mississippi West. We were in the Trans Mississippi West, so there were a dozen of them who came to Iowa and they settled on the coast of the Mississippi River in eastern what is now eastern Iowa, each to found a church and together to found a college. And they accomplished both both aims. They had established churches and they established a college, Iowa College, in Davenport, Iowa, initially. But if you were to, to, to wander the campus or attend classes, which is a very tough curriculum, a very classical curriculum, I would have failed it, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, Latin and Greek and mathematics and so on. It was, it was, but also a lot of uh, what we would think of as evangelical theology. And most of you, most of us in this room, I include myself, would have felt from our own current attitudes very uncomfortable on the campus in, in that era. It was a Christian foundation intended to, to supply pastors and leadership for the Christian churches on the frontier. Also, they were abolitionist. Uh, you're in this, in this period after the Mexican War, the West is opening up. Huge, huge, huge rivalry between the South and the North. Is the West gonna be slave or is it gonna be free? And these folks were determined to make this their territory, the Iowa Territory, free territory. So they were also very strongly abolitionist. Now this changes in the latter part of the 19th century. The college leaves Davenport, partly because of its, its, its uh, uh, attitude towards slavery because da Davenport's a Mississippi River town. They traded with the South. They weren't terribly happy with all these abolitionists in their midst. Various conflicts arose with the city of Davenport. So in 1858, a colony had, in 1854, an abolitionist colony had been founded out here on the prairie by a man named J.B. Grinnell, who modestly named his town Grinnell. Uh, <laughs> rather typical of J.B. And uh, he set aside 100 acres for his university. You can go over to Berlin Library now, the Iowa uh, room, and check out or look at, and you can't check, take, can't take it, but you can look at a prospectus for JB's university. It had courses, faculty in the prospectus. It didn't exist. Uh, but he wanted a college, and so he lured Iowa College uh, to Grinnell in 1858. Still that very orthodox Christian foundation. Then in the late 19, uh, 19th century, the 1890s and so on, things began to change. The college had a very, very progressive president, George Gates. If you've read Joe, Joe Walls, and it's a marvelous, I you expect anything produced by Joe Wall, marvelous history of the 19th century college. And for Joe, Gates is the great hero. He opened the college in a variety of ways. He believed in athletics. And in the 1890s and into the early 20th century, Grinnell became an athletic powerhouse. <laughs> Believe it or not. Uh, in a, a conference with big schools, you know, uh, Iowa State was in it, Kansas was in it, Missouri was in it. Joe, Wall, Joe, Joe Rosenfield went off to football games at the University of Missouri. Uh, that's, these are the, play, the teams we played. And uh, in these earlier days of the, of the late, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, the college was pretty competitive at that level. When I was a student in the 1950s, we would hear Grinnell was the Harvard of the Midwest. Uh, some of us had a little trouble believing that. Uh, and then we believed it more easily when we learned that that was coined because Grinnell was as good as Harvard in athletics. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one thing Gates did. He also believed in a thing called natural philosophy or natural science. And so the natural sciences really began to flourish at Grinnell under Gates. And Gates was a congregational pastor, so he came from this tradition. But he was a much more, we would say today, liberal congregational pastor. And he moved Grinnell into the center of the social gospel movement. 
This was sort of changing the focus from Christ who died on the cross for our sins to Jesus, the teacher, the healer, the reformer. So that, uh, and this is really an oversimplification, but an essential question that a social gospel person would ask when confronted with an ethical or any major decision, oh, what would Jesus have done in this circumstance? So Jesus, the teacher, rather than Christ, the sacrificial lamb, becomes heart of the Christian tradition of Grinnell. So he, it's, a, it's a slow shift, but a major shift. And Grinnell is a leader, becomes a leader in the, in the 1890s, in the early part of the 20th century, in what was called the social gospel movement. Two names are associated with that. They were the first two occupants of the chair of applied Christianity, was, which was created as a social gospel chair. One was George Heron, uh, the other was Edward Steiner. Heron was the first, a, a firebrand preacher speaker who spent, I think, far more time on the Chautauqua circuit than he did on campus. <laughs> uh, I, um, I think he had very little influence on, on campus, but he, he made Grinnell notorious. Uh, he did not believe in private property. Jesus and the, God, and the disciples didn't have private property. Why should we have private property? You know, uh, talk about radical views from a Grinnell faculty member. And, and one of Gates' strengths was that he protected uh, Heron's academic freedom. Heron let him down because he ran off with the dean and women's daughter, left his family, and went to <laughs> Europe. So... Uh, <laughs> And then the chair was empty for a while into the early, early 20th century, and then it was filled, I think it was in 1903, with Edward Steiner, whose interests were different. He was a Jew who had converted to Christianity. Very interesting story, which I will not get into. I could get lost in, in Steiner's story because he came to this country as a youth, uh, to avoid the draft, his father had been killed. He was a, he was a pos, uh, pos, posthumous baby himself, and he wasn't going to get uh, drafted into the uh, Austrian army and so on. So anyway, he came over here, had to learn English, et cetera, et cetera had a very interesting time before he converted to Christianity, went to seminary at Oberlin and became a pastor of four different churches, and then came to Grinnell. If you were to assemble all of Steiner's books on one shelf, it would be about like this. It's by, by far the most productive faculty member in the, in the college's history in terms of volumes of books. Uh, I, w I was curious as to how he could write so much. Well, it turns out he was a kind of field researcher on immigration. He was himself an immigrant, and he was one of the, one of the early historians and analysts of the American immigrant tradition. And he would ride steerage back and forth to Europe in the summers uh, to gather his material, among other, th among other things. He turns out to, turns out to be a, a, a beautiful writer of English. Every one of his books is interesting. I've only read four or five of them, but you could pick up any of his books and find it very in interesting. And he actually was on campus quite a bit. But all, but also traveled the country and was a you know he was a profound Christian, a, Christ, a congregational pastor, uh, who had this special interest in the immigrant experience and the way in which it shaped our society. So anyway, that this is this um, shift, major shift that takes place in the Christian traditions of Grinnell. Now here we are today. I mean, how many of you thought you were attending a Christian college? Or, what, what, or how many of you thought it was even important that you were attending a Christian college? For some, yes. For others, no. Certainly for the current students today if you, and, and faculty, if you were to tell them, well, we are a Christian college, they would say, whoa. Uh, there are many religious traditions on this campus. It, it's extremely broad. Uh, and Christianity is only one. And you know, not even necessarily the important, most important tradition on our campus. 
So we've come a long, long ways from that foundation. And most of the current students have no idea about that foundation or that, that history. Yet, and yet, that history has so much to do with what we are today, I profoundly believe. Because that shift into service, uh, social justice, the kinds of things that were so much a part of the social gospel movement was secularized into a kind of secular humanistic tradition of service and justice. Now, if you begin to talk about service and justice with our current faculty and students, absolutely, absolutely, that's Grinnell, as they describe it. And I think for almost all of us in this room, that's the Grinnell we think we are a part of and it helped to shape us. As a student in the 50s, we still had chapel. Uh, we still were almost exclusively Christian in our background. Uh, so it, it was a little more evident to us at that time than it is now. But we, we would have, had actually moved quite a distance from, from those Christian beginnings. It's interesting, and I, I never fail to mention this because I think it's a wonderful, um, well, fact. We've never been number one in anything. I hate to tell you that, but in the ratings that are out there, we're never rated number one, except in the percentage of graduates who go into public service. The... The Washington Monthly, it was probably five or six years ago, did, you know, they did a survey. And I have to, I have to qualify this. We were behind the service academies uh, at Annapolis or West Point, et cetera, Air Force Academy. About 85% of their graduates go into public service. You wonder what the other 15% do. <laughs> but the highest by far of the non-service academies was Grinnell with 42%. Now, public service is broadly defined. Teaching is public service. I mean, you can, you can, you can, you know, I, I can't even remember what they, what the limits were that they imposed on that. But the next highest other institution, university or college, was about 37 percent. We were by a considerable percentage ahead of everybody else. And I, I guess I'm, I'm very proud of that. Sometimes the trustees worry about that. People in public service don't make very much money. And it's true about Grinnell. We don't have, we've got people with deep, deep pockets, and some of you in, out here have deep pockets, I know. But generally speaking, we graduate people who are not particularly interested in making a pile of money, but are, who are interested in serving their society. So the point here is that what we are today is definitely a product of our history and our past, and we should recognize that. Now to get to the real point of things, the, the trustees discovering the students. The, I will say something about, just a little bit about Joe Rosenfield here at, at this point. Um, as I say, Joe recognized that the college would never survive without an endowment. It took Joe and others a long time long time to build that endowment into something that really could uh, now sustains the college. Uh, you know, we get less than 50% of our income from tuition, far less than 50%, and the rest of it comes from donations and endowment. Uh, but to get, to get to that point took a long time. In the meantime, the college was saved by a death, the death of Fred Darby. Darby was the wealthiest of the trustees when Joe joined in 41, and uh, was a, uh, had oil and gas uh, rep, uh, properties, in, mostly in Oklahoma. Darby died in the early 1950s, and that gave the college some breathing room because his estate is variously obviously assessed at various levels, but uh, the college is still earning money from oil and gas revenues in the Darby estate. The trustees, to their eternal credit, did not sell them off. 
They used them for continuing income. So it was, it was a, at least a gift of $5 million, and it may have been more, which was a lot of money in those days. And it gave the college the breathing room for Joe to develop the endowment. I have facetiously said, without really knowing whether I was telling the truth or not, that the, if the college ever was gonna die, it was when I was a student. I also facetiously say, but there's a lot of truth in it, if you were warm and ambulatory, you could get into Grinnell. <laughs> we were the Depression babies. I was born in 1934. And the college was desperate for students. John Fitch used to get $25 per student that he could rustle up in the Chicago area. <laughs> That's what faculty and staff were doing to supplement their income. The trustees, almost every meeting in this era, was borrowing money to make payroll. It was a hand-to-mouth existence. Think of it. Uh, the college had got through the Depression uh, reasonably well as an institution. Then they get hit with World War II. The student body plummets to about 400. The only way the college survived was a military unit on campus. That's what kept the college alive in those years. Then after World War II, you've got this huge, huge, it seemed at the time, influx of GI Bill veterans. The enrollment grows almost overnight to 1,200. They hired 60% of the faculty in a two-year period. Uh, in order to, and built that, the, you know, anyway, it was, it was incredible. And that was the college that uh, I, I sort of came along just after that period, because then the enrollment plummets again because of the Depression babies, and we're down to about 800 students. The trustees, interestingly enough, in the minutes, they say, when we go to 1,200, when are we, we going to get back to normal, our usual eight or 900? They were worried about 1,200, but they had to, they had, they had to import um, what I want to say, I mean, these sort of um, ready-made houses. I, that's not the word I want to use, but I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> Prefab houses. They're, they're, they bought, they've got 10 prefab houses in there to house the faculty, in these new faculty. Three of them still exist over on Spring Street. Others have been destroyed. But, you know, doing these things, and, and Quonset huts on campus, we rem remember those, uh, in order just to keep the, keep the place going. I mean, this, this college was going through tremendous buffeting winds. And this is the college that Joe decided needed salvation. And um, anyway, uh, ultimately succeeded. By the time Joe died, the endowment was about a billion dollars. It's now much closer to $2 billion. Uh, when, I, when I interviewed Warren Buffett about Joe, when I had a wonderful interview with Warren, I said, Joe, uh, did you and Joe Warren disagree about investments ever? No. Warren, did anybody else besides you and Joe have much to do with the endowment or, uh, investments? No. <laughs> Joe and Warren would talk about weekly uh, on phone and about the college of investments. Uh, Joe got Warren on the board in 1968. He had met Warren at a dinner party in 1967. They hit it off immediately. He lured Warren onto the campus for the big symposium that they had where Martin Luther King spoke in 1968. Warren was enthralled with that speech. In fact, he still gives it out to people in his office. He thinks it's the greatest speech he ever heard, which is essentially a speech about staying awake during a great revolution. Um, anyway, he, he then asked Warren to come on the board. I remember asking one, Warren once when I was president about this relationship, and he said, you know, George, I really don't care very much about Grinnell. It's kind of a strange place. Uh, <laughs> but Joe asked me to be on the board and help with the endowment, and I would do anything for Joe. Warren regarded Joe as a second father, they would spend, Joe would spend Christmas holidays at Warren's Laguna Beach home, and Warren says, I, we, would, we didn't want to have Christmas without Joe. Uh, 
He would come for about two weeks. They installed one of these movable uh, seats on a, on a stair so Joe could get around the house. He was in, in his... Anyway, that for, for about two, uh, I guess 20 years or so, that was the way they would spend Christmas was with, with Joe. So that was an essential relationship. But believe me, Joe had just as much to do with his investment decisions as did Warren. Well, let's get to the revolution. And interestingly enough, the revolution and the growth of the endowment are sort of simultaneous. The college's endowment is really doing pretty well during the revolutionary years. Now, I know from the point of view of the administration, they wondered, are we going to be able to keep these doors open from year to year with this kind of ferment going on at the college. And of course, as you well know, the year after the 69 folks, you missed this folks, but if you'd been here just one more year, you could have missed commencement. Because <laughs> we didn't have a graduation ceremony in 1970. Well, the person who reaped, began to reap the harvest of the student revolution was Howard Bowen. Now, again, the, revolution, the revelation in these minutes with the coming of Howard Bowen. Uh, Joe, by the way, resigned from the Board of Trustees over Sam Stevens. There was a meeting in January of 1954. Uh, we were supposed to have a meeting with a group of faculty, but they called that off and had an executive session all day long. And at the end of that executive session, it was announced that uh, Trustee Joseph Rosenfield has de decided to resign from the board. So for six months, Joe was off the board. Then in June of 1954, Stevens was fired. And the first thing in the minutes is, perhaps Mr. Rosenfield will come back now. <laughs> Without going into the details, Stevens ended up, he was a a very successful president for the first half or so of his tenure, got us through World War II very successfully, but he was an imperial president, hired and fired faculty. He pretty much ran the college out of his hip pocket. And, you know, psychologically, you can sort of see he had so much success and then things began to be much more challenging. A lot of these 60% of the faculty they hired were a different breed of faculty. They were actually challenging the administration. And in any case, Stevens turned out to be dishonest without going into the details. Joe could not stand dishonesty. It was re revealed uh, in that January meeting what he had done. The trustees decided to keep him. Joe left, but then, Things were still firing out of control, so in June, Stevens was fired. Joe comes back. They put him immediately on the search committee. The search committee was found Howard Bowen. Um, I was a senior. That was my senior year when Howard, Howard arrived in the fall of 55. And I can tell you, we didn't know what was going on. We knew the college was sort of downcast and there was some muttering around with the faculty, but they didn't bring us into, into the issues. But it was like a breath of fresh air. And some of you, you know, the 59, 60 people, uh, 59 folks, I guess, were here as freshmen when, when Howard became, came. Um, even as a student, you recognize something's happening. And then as I looked at those board minutes, the college is, in many ways, its horizons are lifted. Its horizons were pretty much focused on Iowa and contiguous Midwestern states up to that point. We want to be a good Midwestern small liberal arts college was our goal. Howard lifted the horizons to the nation and the world. You never heard of anything called the Ford Foundation before Howard arrived on campus. He got three Ford grants, uh, just as, as examples of the kinds of things he did. Also, demographically, things are turning around. We're getting out of the Depression babies. We're not quite in the baby boomers, but it, it's, it's getting better. Howard immediately said, we need to build quality before we build numbers. If we build quality, the numbers will follow. 
For one thing, we won't have nearly as much attrition of students as we've been having. Uh, in any case, he, 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 I don't find any miss, I mean, having been a president, I think I can identify with that sort of the job he's trying to do. Uh, I don't find any missteps with Howard. It, it, it's an extraordinary uh, tenure that he had here, and he transformed this college, or began the transformation. He, I would say there are three absolutely seminal presidencies in this college's history, Maine, Gates, and Bowen, that really had deep, deep, and profound effects on, on the college, and, and how, that's, that's Howard. But, but you get to 1964, and Howard is at sea. The students are misbehaving. <laughs> and he tells them, he tells the board, I tell the students, I will begin to negotiate with you when your behavior improves. <laughs> now, many of you in this room know Howard. Howard was a pretty stiff, formal, somewhat distant individual. He was, truly. He's one of the great leaders of American higher education of the 20th century, no question about it. But he was not well suited to dealing with a student revolution. And it didn't take him long to decide that he wanted to leave Grinnell and uh, shake up a position at the University of Iowa as president. Now, he didn't escape the student revolution at Iowa, but he was buffered. Uh, he didn't, you know, the Grinnell president is, is on the front lines with, with, with students if, if you're at all sensitive to, this, to the issues. So Howard is at sea. He's, he, one board meeting, he says, you know, I've discovered we're not the only college that's facing this. <laughs> And uh, he's relieved that he has been talking to presidential colleagues, and they are equally amazed and nonplussed. I mean, this is why it has to be called a revolution. It's, it's unprecedented, as far as I'm concerned, in higher education in this country, what happened in the late 60s and into the, into the early 70s. It was just a different ball game. Just a different, and you 69 folks created it, or, or hel helped to create it. Yeah. Um, it, it. It's just, it just transformative. And clearly things that, you know, you still have student activism and so on, but today it's very different. Today it's quite different. So this is a, 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 a somewhat unique phenomenon. Now granted, there's a context here, Vietnam. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the, to the, to the, you know, the congregation, the choir, or whatever here. I mean, I was dean at Coward College during these years, and um, so I saw a lot of this. Uh, in fact, I, I was made dean as an untenured professor. I'm passing on the tenure of my colleagues, and I'm not even tenured. And I think the president thought that this young guy might be able to understand this, what's going on with the student. They needed youth in the administration in order to, to not counteract, but to understand and deal with uh, what, what was going on. But, you know, to have that war, which virtually every student eventually, after, not in 64, but by the time you get to the late 60s, profoundly disagrees with, and to be eligible for the draft to go fight in that war and perhaps lose your life and certainly transform your life by being in that awful, awful war. I mean, it, you, it, it's, you know, there's, there's no way that I, I mean, I wasn't eligible for the draft and can fully sympathize and understand with what was going on in student minds at that time. So that had a lot, a lot to do with the revolution. Because, and I saw this at Colorado College, definitely, as a, dean, as a dean, if you were a part of the establishment of Colorado College, you were a part of the establishment that made the event Vietnam War. You're the other side. You're the enemy. And uh, dealt with students a lot of times where there was zero respect for me or what my position. In fact, just the opposite. If I had a position as a college administrator, I had to be corrupt. I could not have taken such a position without being corrupt. 
So there was, there was obviously that issue going on. The civil rights movement is going on. And if nothing else, it reveals techniques that can be used if, if you suppo supposedly powerless to bring power to its knees by acting in concert collectively, by being outrageous at times, by being willing to accept the consequences of what you're doing. Great example of willingness to accept consequences. Uh, and some of you were here at that time, you, you 69 folks were. What was it, the Gates protest? Where uh, on the issue of visitation in the dormitories, the C of HP and League Board spent the night in Gates together, defied the college rules, then they turned themselves in for having defied college rules. Um, and a year later, the two women's dorms presidents just unilaterally abandoned the visitation policy and said we can have free visitation. In other words, and, and, and it was, it was uh, let's see, what, what was the word that was used at the time? I've uh, got that in my notes. Anyway, it was the students seizing the initiative and establishing a sense home rule. You may have college rules, but we outnumbered you. <laughs> uh, we are, and, and, and I'm sure you felt this, the 69. We are the majority of this institution. Who the hell are the faculty of administration or the trustees to dictate to us when we are the majority, we are the student. This college exists for us in our education. Let's assert ourselves, we outnumber them. Uh, and as long as we stick together, we can succeed. And it's, you know, it's very clear in those trustee minutes that pretty soon the trustees are not able to control their decisions. All, the t all this period when you're moving toward coeducational -edu co dormitories, the trustees are talking about building a new women's dormitory on South Campus. <laughs> because the student body's growing. They need more space for students. Two things are going on with the students. They don't want another single sex dorm. Secondly, a lot of them want to live off campus. And what what uh, and so this leakage from the campus into the community, increasingly with seniors and maybe some juniors, that sort of thing, is going on. And the need for new dormitory space begins to be very slender. This the dorm that never was is in the trustee minutes for about four years. <laughs> and finally, I think it was John Norris who said it, reported back to the board. He said, student current student. Uh, Pat, residential patterns and behavioral patterns make this dormitory unnecessary. <laughs> and they finally abandoned, and they abandoned this idea just on the verge of going to coeducational co dormitories. Um, well, again, I, I could, uh, to some degree, recount these step-by-step -step things. I mean, certainly women's hours are, were critical. Uh, if I tell students today, will say, how come South Campus is, the loge is enclosed and North Campus is not? <laughs> the rumor is that South Campus was colder than the North Campus. <laughs> and I say, no, no, they locked up the women that night. What? <laughs> how could that be? How could the women tolerate that, et cetera? And you know, I, I, here I am, I, I, I confess my sexist, character here. I never thought about the fact that when I was a student, they controlled us by controlling them. <laughs> as long as you could lock up the women, you had some chance of maintaining some level of civilized behavior <laughs> on, on, North, on North Campus. And you know, the North Campus problem was much discussed as, as a fairly early manifestation of this. Well, maybe if we, we mix up the dormitories, let's have some women in a North Campus dorm and some men on a South Campus dorm. Maybe that'll work. Well, it happened, but it didn't work. Uh, that did not. And you know, um, one of the things I would tell people when I was president and talk, talking to people of my generation who were particularly the guys, were just, it was abhorrent that the old dorm system had been abandoned. 
those dorm mean I was a North Yonker man. That meant a hell of a lot to me, to be a North Yonker man. Uh, to be a Smith man, you know, that was important. We were in the dorm for four years. We had pins, we had hazing, uh, really pretty tough. Uh, got paddled every Monday night for various transgressions, that sort of thing, which made us then feel so good about our dorm mates who were beating our butts. Uh, it was, you know, and, and, and in retrospect, the guys loved it. And they, they, they couldn't stand, understand how the college could have broken away with what was so, so essential. I mean, it was a, probably the first one or two most important experiences to me and at Grinnell were being a North Yonker man. And the guys in my dorm, they meant a lot to me. Now, they were democratic because we were assigned to our dorms by the deans, but otherwise they were pretty fraternity-like. Well, the one point I could actually make with people from that generation was, think about it. What we have on campus now is much more normal interactions between the genders. It's, it's abnormal to be separated so strongly. You're an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old person. You meet in the classroom. You don't even eat together. Uh, that's a very abnormal way to live. And how are you going to integrate into a larger society and have your, your social group be a coeducational social group, not just a bunch of guys, not just a couple, bunch of women, but a, a coeducational social group? In fact, you, you know, obviously it created dating problems because could you date someone in your social group? That's really kind of a tough decision to make that separation from your group, your collective group. So the students really had a really important case to make. Uh, j just for normal living arrangements. And uh, clearly the pill had something to do with, it, with this context too, because sexual behavior was changing. Not sexual desires. We had just as much desire when I was a student as the students of the late 60s and 70s and so on, but we didn't have the pill. And the fear of pregnancy was huge. And you'd be kicked out of college if you got pregnant. I mean, your whole life, it changes your life, obviously, but hugely, immediately, you're out of, you're out of college. So um, anyway, this, these contextual things are coming together to create something that is absolutely revolutionary. I want to read one, I have a couple of sections of the book to read to, to you, and I want to read one here, which is um, from my inter introduction, uh, which I'm going to bring Joe back, Joe Rosenfield back into the situation here. The year is 1968, in the heart of the student revolution of the 60s and 70s. Picture a tense meeting of the Grinnell College Board of Trustees. The college administration, after several years of student pressure, finally brought a recommendation to the board that co-ed dormitories be established the next academic year. The debate was intense, pitting trustees who either were tired of the battle or who genuinely believed colleges should not be in local parentis against those who believe strongly that colleges in general should uphold societal, societal norms and that highly residential small liberal arts colleges like Grinnell had a special obligation to shield young students from their worst proclivities. <laughs> the debate was extended and intense and it eventually evolved as often was the case without Joe Rosenfield intervening. The trustees were exhausted when Joe finally spoke up. Well, he said, I'm for co-ed dorms if they make them retroactive. <laughs> that was classic Joe, classic Joe. <laughs> the meeting dissolved in spontaneous laughter as Joe, a 1925 Grinnell graduate, immediately settled the issue with incisive humor. The board voted unanimously to approve co-ed dormitories. <laughs> Joe was extraordinarily understanding of Grinnell students. He was one of the older board members that, you know, when I was involved and John was involved. But he, I think John would agree here, instinctively 
understood the students at least as well, if not better, than most of his colleagues. Joe, as a student from 21 to 25, was extremely, he was known as Lina Day Rosenfield. He had some, a quip all the time. He and his good friend Bob Fell had a S&B column their senior year called Doric, a column of pure beauty. <laughs> and it was a humor column, and it's really very fun. I've got a lot of excerpts from that in the book. But during the height of the student revolution, not surprisingly, Joe as a trustee was hearing from people from his generation about what the hell is going on at Grinnell. And here's a letter that Joe wrote to E.A. Norelius, who was captain of the football team when Joe was a student. And he, he wrote, um, now for the situation of the college, I would be foolish to say that student behavior is perfect or that the administration and the trustees haven't made mistakes in judgment. I know that there are a small number of students, very, very small, who are out to destroy our basic society and the college along with it. But I am equally certain that the overwhelming majority of students are bright, dedicated young people who are genuinely concerned with the fabric of our society and the seemingly unsolvable problems rampant in our country today. I get to the college several times a year and I have a chance to talk to lots of them, and at length. I constantly compare them with the students who were in school during our day. We were a decent enough lot, and I think that the education we received at Grinnell helped us to become better citizens as the years rolled by. But how many of us had the slightest concern about ending war, assisting the poor and underprivileged, giving black minorities a decent chance at a normal existence? The students of today are concerned with these problems, and if this concern occasionally results in intemperate or hasty conduct, I think we as old and imperfect alumni should not cast the first stone. That was Joe. Now, um, other issues were going on at, at this time. Student diversity, usually, usually at Grinnell in those days, meaning African American. And I want, I want to say today, I think we're finally getting there. I mean, being this sort of isolated college in the middle of the cornfields of Iowa, how do you attract the nation at large, the world at large to it? 20% of our students are international at this point. Over 20% of our, closer to 25% of our students are per, students of color. You walk on campus today and it isn't, it isn't like it used to be and certainly was when I was a student and even when I was president. Oh, there's a black student or there's a Hispanic student or there's an Asian American student. No, you don't even think about it. Uh, it's, they're just here, they're Grinnell. You, uh, I challenge you at a commencement ceremony, <laughs> looking at those names to, to pronounce them. <laughs> there is a minority now of Anglo-Saxon names. And I, I have utmost respect for my colleagues who are chairs of the various divisions who have to pronounce those names. It's amazing. There, there's a, and even, I'm still teaching tutorials. I have you know, 13 or 14 students, and I stumble around with, it, with their names. Uh, it, it's, it's, the world has come to Grinnell. So all those efforts that were made earlier to make Grinnell appropriate and hospitable to the world at large, not just to a segment of that world, are beginning to pay dividends. Curricular reform was a part of your era. Now, a lot happened in your era that transformed this campus. Obviously, co-ed dorms probably mo most particularly. But think about the curriculum. You late 60s folks were very, um, let's say, constricted by your curriculum. You wanted transformation toward a much looser set of requirements, or maybe even no requirements. Now, at Colorado College, the issue also was grades. We shouldn't have grades. We could be, we're then making all these separations among people and so on. And I'm sure that conversation happened at Grinnell, too, but it really focused on the curriculum. So 
in the late 60s, early 70s, profound discussions on campus with the faculty being deeply, deeply influenced by student attitudes and desires, led to a curriculum reform which, think of it, that reform is still in place today. The curriculum at Grinnell College was created in 1970 and we still have it. We call it by a different name. Uh, it was called then an old requirements curriculum and now it's called the individually advised curriculum. <laughs> Same thing with different dressing. Uh, now granted, many of our faculty are products of that student revolution and so they profoundly agree with the openness of it. A very important thing was done in that curricular reform was creating the, the first year tutorial. We call the freshman tutorial, now it's the first year tutorial. I still teach it. And you are the advisor for the students for their, until they declare a major, which usually comes somewhere in the second year. Uh, and we're pretty direct in advising. The longest lines when we used to have a, a physical first year res, uh, registration were in front of mathematics. We have very strong language departments, no language requirement. So the idea of having volunteers among a very talented group of students who are mostly well-educated by the time they get here works with uh, strong advising. You connect, if you're teaching students, you can, you're in a better position to advise them. They know you, you know them, and you can develop a, a certain degree of trust in that connection so that the first year tutorial I think has been the reason that we maintain that curriculum of the 70s. A lot of colleges changed their curriculum in the 70s. Most of them have gone back to something pre-70s. We in Brown, I think, are the only two institutions from that period who have kept that transformation. You people had a lot to do with that, you, folk, you 69 folks, and it still is deeply influential at Grinnell. Well, let's see, I'm, I'm, I'm just about ready to wind up here, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm sort of gonna issue a, a, a challenge, particularly to you 69 folks. My thesis is it really was a revolution, and it shows up in almost every manifestation of the college. I mean, I, I was not here in the late 60s, I was another institution, I was not dealing with its issues, but I read about Grinnell, and I remember being absolutely amazed with the coeducational bathrooms. <laughs> I mean, Grinnell always, I would say, virtually cutting edge nationally with coeducational. There weren't many institutions. And believe me, the alums were, whoa, what's going on? I couldn't have stood to be in coeducational bathrooms. What is this thing called dial -a john uh, you know, that thing, you know, male, don't care who comes in, female, only female come in, whatever, I forget what was on the dial john But because of the character of the dorms with one bathroom per floor, and now with co-educational floor, who's gonna go upstairs to use the bathroom? It just didn't work. So, you know, we've, re we've re redone the dorm, so it's a little easier now because we have more facilities, but here the college was stuck with those facilities and how are we gonna deal with it? So, I mean, that's probably symbolically about as revolutionary, and it happened in a hurry. It happened in a hurry, as you can think of. So I'm, I, my thesis is it was a revolution and it shows up in an awful lot of ways. You know, things did continue into my time as, as president in the 80s. Uh, we had huge gender issues to deal with. South Africa. 15 years that went on, 15 years, and at least two or three invasions of the board meeting. <laughs> board members facing walking a gaunt, long gauntlet of students just to get to the board meeting. We, the board, to its eternal credit, said, you know, we're not very good at, at, at deciding about divestment, 
but we're good at education. Let's educate black South African students. And there was a program run through Harvard. We took more students from, the, the, from that program than any other institution. Full ride for four South African black students every year. And we gra ended up graduating quite a number of black South African students. We even created a scholarship at uh, Marshalltown Community College, one, one scholarship there. So the, the, we had, we'd had issues, and students were still pretty demonstrative. My first thing I was told by Dale Hahn as he's showing me at my office was my special phone in case the school students cut the phone line so I could, <laughs> I could get out. This is, this is 1979. Uh, so things are still going on. The year before I was, became president, the students staged a food fight during prospective student weekends just to sh over at Quad, just to show what Grinnell was like. <laughs> My first year, uh, I, I would go to the dorms and uh, to the dining hall and eat with students once or twice a week and just sit down with whoever. Sometimes it was comfortable, sometimes it wasn't. This was the most uncomfortable. I sat down with a bunch of scruffy looking guys and I thought, well, don't be prejudiced about the way they look, just sit there with them. They wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> and one of them was scribbling away, Scott Adams actually, <laughs> uh, who, uh, and I thought, oh, gee, he's got a paper due this afternoon. He's writing it during lunch. But no, it was a prospective student weekend with parents and students there in the dining hall. This is quad. All of a sudden, they say, look at each other and say, now. Scott stands up on his chair. and He said, uh, prospective students and parents, this college has been filling you with a lot of crap. <laughs> we want to tell you about the real Grinnell, drugs, sex. <laughs> Here's the president of the college sitting there while this is going on. And they, they had a table set out, out, out in the hallway. They wanted the parents and students to come and, and check these things out. Um, they thought I'd come to stop them. <laughs> I hadn't any idea what was going to happen. Uh, protest over, we won two football games. So we had a huge protest about overemphasizing athletics at the college. So, you know, things, things were not totally calm in my time. But believe me, I went, did not go through anything like Glenn Leggett went, went through. Glenn Leggett inherited the wind and I think dealt with it beautifully. Uh, I'm not sure how you folks felt about it, but Glenn, just, just to keep the college holding together at, at that period became a, a real accomplishment. It was hard to say our vision is this and we're gonna accomplish that. Our vision is we're gonna stay a college, we're gonna still educate students and we're gonna survive. And so it was a revolution.